Okay. Well, uh, thank you for uh, being here, all of you. As you know, today, two, two things. Uh, we, we, we were able to witness two things uh, today at the United Nations. One is the debate in the Security Council, which is still continuing. And the other one uh, is uh, uh, a diplomatic political battle in the ECOSOC which I will dwell on it, concerning a resolution about the adverse effect of the Israeli occupation on uh, the economic development of uh, Palestine. With regard to the first one, uh, there has been a, a very uh, clear trend uh, by the great majority of countries talking about the different subjects that we are facing from the aggression against our people in Gaza, the ceasefire efforts by Egypt and the UN, uh, the, uh, the racist uh, law adopted by the Israeli Knesset in which they legislated uh, segregation and differentiation between uh, people on the basis of only whether you are a Jewish or not the right to self-determination only to the Jews and not to the Palestinian Arabs, uh, issues related to settlements, displacement, Khan al-Ahmar, and things of that uh, nature, and also the, the subject of providing protection uh, for the uh, civilian population. The report that we are awaiting from the SG, uh, hopefully that it will be released on the 13th of August. Just only to mention some of the subjects that were debated and are still deba being debated in the Security Council. There were only two, one member of the Council and one not a member of the Council, who deviated from this general trend and concentrated, one, in trying to label one political uh, organization as a terrorist organization on the Palestinian side that he keeps repeating this uh, effort, and uh, it doesn't seem that anybody is picking up on that uh, exercise of futility. The other one, uh, the representative of the United States tried to show that there is nothing but talks at the UN, and only the United States is the contributor to UNRWA and to, uh, to the Palestinian uh, National Authority. Of course, that sort, that kind of arrogant discourse offended many, and some responded. The most eloquent response was the response of the ambassador of Saudi Arabia, who used numbers in which he said that the contribution uh, of uh, Saudi Arabia to UNRWA was a billion dollar, and their contribution to helping the Palestinian people over the years exceeded six billion dollars. Of course, it was uh, typical of the uh, Trump administration insulting their allies and their friends because she was insulting close allies to the United States, such as the Arab countries in the Gulf region, including Saudi Arabia, that warranted that uh, very uh, clear response from the ambassador of Saudi Arabia. You cannot come to the Security Council in an arrogant way to say that you are the only one who is helping and others are not doing anything. That is not the case. And if they care about the uh, humanitarian situation of uh, the Palestine refugees, especially the 1.2 million in the Gaza Strip, you do not stop $300 million uh, away from UNRWA under any pretext and say that you care about the humanitarian situation of the people there. Action speaks louder than any articulation in this regard. You cannot defend that policy of cutting hundreds of millions of dollars of money from UNRWA. But we are also happy that the message war was loud and clear by almost everyone else that UNRWA is a good thing, should not be abandoned, and it contributes significantly to the stabilization of the entire Middle East. And there is a determination by the international community not to abandon UNRWA, and the action of the US administration is to try to destroy 
UNRWA. In this connection, when she complained that how could the Palestinians refuse the effort of the United States without even seeing it and reading it. And I think that we have in our uh, tradition, in Arabic we say that you know the letter from the address written uh, on it. Uh, for her knowledge, the reason why we are not interested in what they are going to be proposing because the writing is on the wall. Jerusalem is off the table. Honorwa, I mean refugees are off the table. Honorwa to be destroyed through their action of denying substantial amount of money. Uh, uh, settlements are more or less uh, acceptable and the two-state solution is not in the card deck. So if you have that kind of behavior that is exhi being exhibited by the U.S. administration. So what is left on the table? So that's why we don't want to engage in something that uh, is useless because all the things that they have announced unilaterally are things that will not pave the way for peace and progress. That's with regard to the, what happened in the Security Council. While we were busy in the Security Council, we had a very, uh, another interesting uh, diplomatic uh, uh, exercise in the ECOSOC. We have an annual resolution that talks about the adverse effect of occupation on the uh, economy of uh, Palestine. This time, the United States uh, sort of like uh, uh, thinking that they did something in the General Assembly when we dealt with the issue of protection, and then they thought that there is something happening at the UN, they want to build on it. And that is under the uh, uh, slogan of submitting amendments. So the ambassador that follows the economic issues in the U.S. mission came to that meeting, and uh, she was outraged when she saw that the group of 77, or some of their members, uh, submitted an amendment uh, to counter the narrow amendment of Israel executed by the United States because uh, Israel is not a member of uh, ECOSOC. It, the United States is the member. And the Israeli, you know, uh, amendment uh, concentrate only in demanding the release of Israeli bodies and uh, prisoners in the Gaza Strip. So the amendment by the G77 members uh, stipulates that uh, all prisoners, all bodies, should be dealt with in accordance with the international law. Not only the two or three, or, or I don't know how many, that uh, uh, Israel has in the Gaza Strip. In our case, we have large number of bodies that Israel is uh, holding and refusing to release them to allow for honorable barrier by the Palestinian families. And we have thousands of prisoners that you know we would like them to be uh, released. So that the Americans fought against allowing this amendment to be entertained. And losing her cool and becoming so nervous and trying to bully people that they, she wanted uh, an adjournment for 24 hours so that the US can use the usual way of uh, pressuring capitals so that the results of the voting to be to their liking. So that obstructionist motion was put to a vote. Guess how many votes the U.S. representative received? Edith, tell me how many votes she re received. She received only one. And 40 voted in the opposite direction. So that obstructionist motion was defeated. That's number one. Then they put the motion, the Israeli motion, put by the Israeli representative. Guess how many votes that motion received? Five. So it was defeated. 
Then the resolution was put to a vote and received 45 and two voted against it. So three consecutive defeats uh, to this uh, arrogant and uh, uh, you know, sensational behavior of thinking that they can create split among the ranks of, let's say, the G77 and China and the international community in a very selfish, narrow way. The international community and the G77 were much wiser in terms of accommodating everyone with the amendment that they suggested, which the U.S. delegation wanted that amendment not to be put to a vote, and they received only one vote. Remember what happened in the Security Council of something similar, and there was only one vote in the Security Council versus others? In the ECOSOC was one vote to try to obstruct this motion from being put to a vote. So we had what we had in the Security Council, and the debate is still continuing. And we had in the, ECOSOC, in the ECOSOC this charade of Israel and the United States who were mesmerizing themselves of that the things are changing at the UN to their uh, uh, desire by thinking that they discovered something huge and remarkable of introducing amendments. And I think that uh, this exercise today in ECOSOC would one can characterize it of triple failure of this behavior of those who are so arrogant, threatening and shouting at people in the chamber for how dare you propose an amendment that would not allow our amendment to be considered first, thinking that their amendment would be possibly adopted. Let me say in this connection, we are grateful for the G77 and China, for the uh, remarkable role they played, and we are grateful to the European Union who voted unanimously on the first voting on the, against the disruptionist motion of the United States, and who voted also uh, unanimously for the resolution among the 45 uh, uh, countries. So I just wanted to share these things with you, and. Uh, I will now entertain your questions. Sorry. Uh, I'm a little bit confused. Can we just clarify? So in ECOSOC, uh, the US put forward their amendment, and then a rival amendment was put forward. A what? Which, what? A rival amendment, another amendment? Is that no. correct? Okay, there, can you just spell it out step there by There were three votes. Uh -huh. There was an amendment submitted by members of the G77 and China. That refers to the whole issues of bodies, you know, that are denied being delivered to their families and prisoners. That uh, amendment, which was submitted by members of the G77 and China, outraged the Americans, and they did not want that amendment to uh, put to a vote, and then they asked for suspending the meeting for 24 hours. That effort, because you know, once you start the uh, voting, you cannot suspend the meeting. So they challenge the ruling of the chair, or the rules of procedure, by putting their request to a vote. They were defeated, 1 to 40. Then the amendment of the Israelis, which was executed by the Americans regarding the bodies and the prisoners of Israel alone, was put to a vote. They received five votes. That's the second thing. And the third thing, the original text with the amendment that was added to it to make it more inclusive was put to a vote and received 45 votes and two voted against. So that's what happened in the ECOSOC today. So the G77 amendment was just included in the vote on the entire resolution? Yes. Okay, great, yes. thank you. But you see that I'm just describing to you results but uh, my colleagues who were in the meeting can even describe to you the emotions and uh, uh, the amount of how upset 
the delegates of the United States. No, it was the lady ambassador that, uh, is that Kari? Yes, that's the one. And for also, Ambassador uh, Dannon uh, was also in the back room orchestrating his team, trying to convince country, uh, criticizing country of how dare you come up with something different. All of them were there. I wasn't there. My team was there. And three defeats in the ECOSOC chamber uh, because of this behavior of the Israeli delegation, of course. And the who are the five? Who are the five that voted? Well, I, I cannot do your homework for you. You go and do it, your homework and do some homework. All right. Can I get a big picture question, yes, Ali. Ambassador? And just a big picture question. What's the big picture? Uh, well, well, let, let Pam all right. go. All right. Thank you, Ambassador. Pamela from CBS. Uh, the, in, you dismissed a lot of the issues of the Trump administration's peace plan. Kushner has proposed one that would include rebuilding Gaza. Is there any, any way forward on the big picture peace plan? You what see, would you tell them to do? Well, they are the ones who are doing negative things and they're not doing positive things. No, I don't mean here. I mean, how do you get to peace? I know it's a big picture. You picture, get to peace by accepting the global consensus as we agreed to it here in the United Nations, and it was repeated for the 10th time or maybe more by the UK representative and the Netherlands representative. We all know what peace requires, two states on the basis of 1967 borders. If there is an adjustment to the borders mutually agreed to by both sides, then that is allowed, and uh, Jerusalem, East Jerusalem to be the capital of the state of Palestine, the other part would be the capital of the state of Israel, and a just solution to the refugee question. This is the global consensus. The Arab Peace Initiative, the Madrid principles of uh, uh, P uh, land for peace, the roadmap, all the terms of reference that are acceptable to everyone, including Security Council resolutions and other UN relevant resolutions. So if they accept that global consensus and uh, play a constructive role with others, uh, such as the other uh, permanent members of the Security Council, the Quartet, uh, maybe other countries who uh, would be interested in playing a positive role, then Israel would see that there is a determination from the international communi community that this conflict has to be resolved on such basis, on the basis of two-state resolution, as the Secretary General always keep repeating there is no plan B for the two-state solution, not to come and say Jerusalem is off the table, refugees of, off the table, two-state is off the table, uh, settlements uh, are maybe not on the table, maybe are under the table. If you come up with this attitude, you are not opening door for peace, you are opening doors for the opposite of peace, the perpetuation of this conflict. Ambassador. Ali. Uh, Ambassador, uh, Ambassador Haley uh, have been um, uh, recently consistent on one thing, that the Palestinians are not uh, accepting the realities on the ground and that you should accept the reality on the ground. Second, today uh, she said that the United States is doing better for the Palestinians than all the Arab countries in, uh, uh, all together and maybe all the, the whole world together. And you should listen uh, to the United States, not to any other uh, Arab country, uh, countries uh, who are misleading the Palestinians. Uh, beside those failures that you spoke about uh, just now uh, in the uh, ECOSOC and uh, recently in the uh, General Assembly. What do you make of those failures of the United States? Thank you. Well, I, say I, I responded you know, to these questions in, in my earlier intervention, uh, earlier intervention. I said, for example, Saudi Arabia responded to them. It's not true that only the United States that is doing everything and nobody else, else is doing anything. That is not true. So I, I responded to that, not only you know, that even the Chinese delegation, 
He said, we are not in a competition with who pays what. We do what is right. And we do what we believe would contribute to uh, bringing you know, peace to the table. And he echoed our proposal for convening an international conference so that everybody to shoulder their responsibility. So this kind of talk that nobody is doing anything except the United States. It, no, uh, uh, coming to the reality, this, this is an old concept that usually oppressive, uh, oppressive countries or colonial countries or occupiers, they tell the people who are under oppression, you don't accept reality. What is reality? The reality that Israel is oppressing us and occupying us, therefore we have to accept that reality. We will never accept that reality. The United States of America, during the struggle of the 13 colonies, one of them is a state that she was a governor of, South Carolina. The 13 colonies refused to accept reality as it was of the British colonization. That's why they had the American Revolution. And they succeeded in changing that oppressive reality into the independence of the 13 states and the Declaration of Independence, in which I quoted a sentence from it in my statement today. So for us, we will never accept the reality that Israel is going to occupy us forever. We will never accept uh, oppression. We are for freedom and dignity, and that cannot happen until we put an end uh, to uh, occupation. So that we will not accept the reality that she is uh, in her mind, uh, that reality, we want to change, we want freedom, we want independence. And that is not an invention of the Palestinian people. All those in Africa, in Latin America, and in Asia who struggled against colonialism refused to accept that kind of reality. In fact, with regard to the nationality you know, law in Israel, which takes us back to 1898 in the United States, in which segregation was legislated, the American people refused to accept that, and we had a very uh, uh, heroic movement by the name of the civil rights movement during the 50s and 60s, and put an end to that form of racism uh, through segregation and the Jim Crow laws. And uh, in fact, in 1954, when the Supreme Court turned over through Brown versus the Board of Education that separate, uh, separate was equal according to 1898. The Supreme Court in 1954 said uh, separate is not equal. So therefore, it turned it around and it started the process of putting end to segregation. The irony now in Israel, they are legislating and going back to 1898, but this is Israeli version of it. That's why I said that the Israeli ambassador has another title to him, not only the PR of Israel, but he is the representative of the Jim Crow uh, laws and regulations of the state of, of Israel, meaning that they're beginning uh, in a legal way, although segregation and discrimination has been in place in the state of Israel since the beginning of giving preferential treatment to those who are Jews versus others. But in the Knesset, when they legislated that after 70 years, they made it a legal system, the system of discrimination and preferential treatment to the Jew versus others. Ambassador, you mentioned that the, you felt that the administration was trying to take refugees off the table. In addition to the cutoff of aid on UNRWA, can you give us sort of specific examples of what you think the White House negotiating team is doing to take refugee issues off the table? Well, when you take $300 million of uh, the uh, budget of UNRWA on an annual basis that the United States of, uh, of America that was uh, uh, given, which could conceivably lead to the destruction of UNRWA, then it means that they're telling the host countries, absorb those refugees, make them citizens of your country, or deal with them in any way you want, because we don't want to deal with the question of refugees. That's the ramification of their action. Don't listen to what they say. Uh, pay attention to what they do, because 
Action speaks louder than articulation. Their action is leading to the destruction of UNRWA. And all of us are trying to find ways to save UNRWA. And by the way, UNRWA and Resolution 194 and the mandate of UNRWA and Resolution 194 were written by American uh, diplomats in 1949. And they kept introducing these resolutions from 1949 until the Oslo agreements in the early 90s. It was their product. It was the formula of having voluntary contribution to look after UNRWA was, you know, a, a big idea of the United States of America. And all of a sudden now, they're changing their mind. And if they are changing their mind while they're telling us that they have the deal of deals, put one and one together, then you come to the conclusion that also the refugees and UNRWA are off the table. Yes, sir. Ambassador, um, a follow-up to Pam's question on really where things go next. We've had 18 months of the Trump administration saying, wait, we have a plan, it's coming soon. You clearly have lost faith with the, their plan because of the things that they've done. Who now should step up in the international community to lead this? We said that there are several options. We want a collective approach. An international conference which was legislated for the, so, uh, for, for the Russian Federation to convene it in accordance with Resolution 1850 and the Annapolis process. If uh, the Russian Federation calls for an international conference, we will attend. Uh, France uh, attempted to have international conference twice. Uh, it did not get uh, very far, and the administration was changed in Washington, D.C. The Trump administration is not interested. Uh, the Chinese today, they called for the convening of an international conference. We could also look in a positive way to the invigorating role of the quartet because it is a collective approach, perhaps to enlarge it by other uh, delegations such as China and others who might be interested, Japan and perhaps others, uh, to be included in this collective process. The P5 and the Security Council could be a form of a collective approach. So we are open for all these things, and we are the, the ones that initiated such suggestions when our president came in February uh, to the Security Council and proposed such collective uh, uh, approach, and we are uh, actively engaged in these things. The Russians extended an invitation for us and the Israelis to have uh, negotiation under the auspices of the Russians in Moscow. Uh, we expressed a positive answer as was indicated today in the speech of the Russian representative. The Israeli side is still, you know, are not uh, committed to accommodate such uh, a suggestion. So you see from us, we are saying that before, uh, after 6th of December, when the United States declared their new uh, illegal and uh, provocative policy vis-a-vis -vis Jerusalem, they lost the qualification to be the only party to supervise the political process. Now we are saying we want a collective process. Within that collective process, they play a role, but they cannot be the only one to supervise this process. It seems to me the team in Washington, D.C., they still think that we are the only game in town. It's us or nothing. And then, you know, if that is the case, we are not a player to accommodate their desires. Mr. Ambassador. Mr. Ambassador, on the U.S. relations with the Palestinians, um, seems to be clear that um, this long-awaited U.S. peace proposal is cooked and maybe produced sometime soon. Have you had any dealings at all with Ambassador Haley or anybody else in the U.S. administration? Is this proposal dead on arrival? I don't know if they have uh, truly a proposal or not. They keep saying that uh, they're close to finishing it, but they are uh, so eager for our engagement. Uh, officially, we are not going to engage for the reasons that I explained, and many Palestinian officials, including our president, who have indicated we will not engage in something that was dead 
uh, upon arrival before even we received it. So therefore, for me, I don't have, uh, you know, uh, a relationship with Ambas Ambassador Nikki Haley because uh, her attitude and her behavior, uh, she doesn't spare a moment uh, for unleashing, you know, uh, something that is so negative vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinian people under the pre a pretext of becoming, uh, under the pretext of defending Israel. In fact, she is becoming more Israeli than the Israelis themselves. And in fact, the statement that she gave in the Security Council, uh, the way one can read it, it is insulting important allies to the United States for the sake of promoting uh, an unconditional defense on Israel, which one can say that that is, uh, uh, you know, not in the interest of the United States, much more in the interest uh, of, of Israel. In her speech, Ambassador Haley made a note that despite the fact that uh, the United States has been a huge, uh, large uh, contributor to UNRWA, uh, you in the council and in the last 20 minutes or half an hour now has have been criticized, very critical of the United States and especially of her. So doesn't she have a point in saying that uh, the American people will see this as biting the hand that feeds you? No, first of all, we are not uh, uh, criticizing her. They, it, we are defending ourselves from a continuous onslaught by the United States, by her and her delegation. I just gave an example in the ECOSOC. In fact, even in the ECOSOC, she reprimanded and criticized the G77 and China by telling them, how dare you, you select the state of Palestine to chair the G77 and China for the year 2019. Her ambassador for economic matters attacked us for, for such a thing. It is none of her business. It is the business of the G77 and China, 135 countries who elected the state of Palestine to preside over that group for the year 2019. So now who is attacking who and who is defending himself? It's uh, an, uh, Ambassador Haley when she says that, well, we stopped giving the money to UNRWA, who is attacking in terms of action. Uh, the attack is coming from their side, not us. When you remove Jerusalem from the table, who is attacking? We are not attacking. We were having good relationship with them. We're just defending ourselves from such onslaught from you know, the US administration against us. And I think that that is legitimate for us to defend ourselves, and that is what we are doing. Thank you very much.